A number of years after the birth of Christ here on the earth as the man Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved various apostles, especially Matthew and Luke, to record the actual events that surround the birth of Christ. And they also tell us, especially John and the Apostle Paul, were moved by the Holy Spirit to tell us how the New Testament church responded to and rejoiced in the birth of Christ. For example, John 1.14, and the Word, oh, who's the Word? Well, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. There's nothing made but that was made by Him. This is the eternal God, the Creator God, the same one that's spoken about in Genesis chapter 1. And he says in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The outshining radiance of God could not be totally hidden, even though Jesus did not live as God, He lived as man, as God intended man to live, in total dependence upon His Father. And so there was an outshining radiance and display of the character of God when Jesus was upon the earth. So, we beheld his glory, John says, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when John thought about the coming of Christ and the birth of Christ, that's what came to his mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. That's a major theme. The whole Bible is about a redemptive plan to save sinners. But we don't want to talk about sin. We have enough problems. Let's not talk about sin in church. Well, then rip the Bible up. Burn it. Throw it away. Or better yet, don't pretend to be a Christian. If you're not willing to face the bad news you will have no treasure in your heart for the good news. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He came to the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Then later on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was made visible in human flesh. What an astounding wonder. In 1 John 3, 5, and we know that he, Jesus, was manifested. He appeared in visible form to take away our sins. So the New Testament believers, especially those who were in leadership, they were greatly impacted by the birth of Christ. Not as some sort of one day a year celebration but it was the core essence of what it meant to be a Christian for them. They could not escape the truth of the incarnation of God in the flesh. And so this morning, we open the Word of God and we will witness people and angels in excitement and joy and rejoicing because of the birth of Christ. Why? Because God had come in the flesh and he'd come to save sinners. Well, that's not nearly as exciting as what we do this time of year. Well, it depends. And some of you have this memorized, and that's okay. <laughs> I've never been excited about a seaplane. But then a seaplane has never been the source of my temporal salvation. Men, 50 years after having been saved by, from, sudden, from, from imminent death, they'd been on the ocean for four days. All hope was gone. Their ship had been sunk by a Japanese sub. No one knew they were there. Half of the 900 survivors are already dead. 
and they're holding on to dear life. And a seaplane sees the oil slick and comes down and radios and, and uh, deliverance starts. And so now, 50 years later, as one of the survivors is talking about it with tears coming down his cheek, he said, that was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen in my life. So if you're sitting here and you have in your, in your history, in the profile of who you are, a conscious awareness, I was a sinner without hope and without God. And God came. We allow the stuff of this passing world to lead us to pass right over that as if it's nothing. Oh yeah, Jesus came. Oh, sweet little Jesus in a manger. How sweet. Are you kidding me? God in the flesh to become your sin barrel without which you would spend an eternity in the burning fires of hell forever and ever and ever. Amen. So we start in the sequence by turning and we're not going to read all of these I'm going to call them to your attention I would encourage you to to do your own personal study but in Luke chapter 1 verse 5 through 25 is the occasion where Gabriel visits Zacharias and he's going to be the earthly father of John the Baptist and by the time this scene is finished John Zacharias has been made unable to speak because of his spirit of unbelief about what the angel said and his previously barren wife is pregnant and their son would be the one that we know as John the Baptist then after Gabriel visited Zacharias as you go down to verse 26 through 38 Gabriel visits Mary six months after Elizabeth conceived John by Zacharias, Mary, a virgin, conceived the Son of God by the direct agency of the Holy Spirit. The virgin conception and virgin birth of Jesus Christ is absolutely necessary for your salvation. Amen. We had a part of that in our Sunday school class this morning. The miracle of conception in order to have sinless blood. The blood is pat the sin nature is passed through the man. If he had, if Jesus had been born of a mere man such as any of us, he would have been born with a sin nature. He could have paid for nobody's sin. And there are many today in places of higher learning and in churches and pulpits who uh, pay little attention or even deny the virgin birth of Christ without which you have no salvation. It's very alarming. Back in Luke chapter 1 verse 26 through 38, in these verses we are given a lot of things and one of the things we're given is a confession of Mary which is good for you seven days a week. Good for me seven days a week. Life tumbles in, life comes across your plate and there is just a, a statement of faith just to make right up front. Before you know anything else, before you know what's going to take place or how it's going to work out, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Be it unto me according. I don't, I don't understand. I, I'm confused. I'm troubled. Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Then in Luke chapter 1, verse 36 through 56, Mary visited Elizabeth. And when she arrived in the presence of Elizabeth, John is six months in Elizabeth's womb. And you know this incredible moment in history when John in the womb of Elizabeth comes into the presence of Jesus in the womb of Mary. John worships. He's full of joy. He jumps for joy. Because he's coming to the presence not of a mere babe, not of a glob, but of a child. And this child is God in the flesh. Amen. It's an incredible moment in history. 
John is in his mother's womb. Messiah in the, moon, the, in the womb of the virgin. John leaps in total, focused, undiluted worship. In the womb of Mary was the God-man, worthy of worship. And John in the womb of his mother worshipped. Now, as we look at these events, uh, it's important, I think, and, and I know this strikes right in the way of culture and, and people with a lot of good intentions, and, and we did this and 20,000 got saved. I, I don't care what you have to say about it. All I'm going to tell you is that there's no one in the Scripture that ever took this momentous occasion of the birth of Christ and tried to reenact it. We do it with a lot of sincerity, but see, you see, here's the problem. That's not just a, ma a babe. It's God. There's no place in the Scripture where I have a right to play God, to pretend to be God. There's nobody in the Scripture who does it. Why? Because when you start trying to play God, and you start trying to act out being God, what goes down the drain? The deity of Christ. It's lost. And you're left ooing and aahing over, oh, they did such a wonderful, I've never seen such a beautiful baby Jesus. Oh, your child, your, your daughter was such a beautiful Mary. And we go on and on and on. And we may have read all the scriptures, but we're left with a human expression. We were sincere. We intended to do well. All I'm telling you is do whatever you want to do. I'm not, your, I'm not your Lord and Master. I'm just telling you, I'm just reporting that there's a reason why the New Testament church never did it. You're trying to do something that you can't do. You can't add to. You can't make it more plain. You can't improve it. It's not something that's to be replicated. When we seek to act out God or Jesus in visual form, the deity of Christ is hidden. Here's another note from this portion in verse 41 through 46. And again, we know this, but we live in a time when we need to underscore it. In the womb of every expectant mother is a child. Do not abort. Also, give your unborn child a healthy environment of God's word and praise. They're capable of worshiping Jesus, even in the womb. Amen. Speak to them. Talk to them. Give them God's word. Mom and dad, provide an atmosphere of love. You say, well, uh, I'm not sure who you're talking about other than Jaden and Reed. Well, we're talking this to Jaden and Ree. But you have children, you have grandchildren, you have great-grandchildren, and you can pass on the wonder of this reality that here is a child who, it, who at, in the womb is, is worshiping. Amen. Now, like all of us, and again in this same passage, Mary was a sinner. Aren't you afraid to say that? No. She himself said that she knew and rejoiced in God her Savior. She knew she was a sinner. So in this scene there is, in verse 41 through 46, the exclu is exclusively about rejoicing in the Savior. Well, this is as it should be for Jesus in Bethlehem and Jesus at Calvary brings into focus what? That what we're dealing with here is the ultimate disaster and the ultimate rescue operation that has ever taken place on the face of the earth. Amen. And once and for all, a disaster that covers all humans God deals with that disaster by one event, by coming to Bethlehem and to Calvary in the person of his son, so that there's hope for sinners. 
Now in Luke chapter 1 verse 57 through 80 and Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 through 25, Mary returns home, John the Baptist is born, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph. When Mary, three months pregnant, returned home, needless to say, Joseph was shocked. They were betrothed. Uh, in their culture, in that, the way, way of doing things, that was stronger than engagement. But that's sort of to give an idea. Typically in our culture, a, a, a couple who are engaged, it's all been narrowed down. There's no more fishing, no more looking. We've zeroed in. And we're hoping to get married. Well, there it was much stronger. When you were betrothed, you, even cons you were considered husband and wife, but you had not consummated the marriage. And so, all they were, they were considered married, they had not consummated, they were to remain, to remain virgins during this time. And so, can you imagine when Joseph sees Mary coming and he notices something different? We don't know all the conversation, but in short order, he realizes she's pregnant. He's heartbroken. He had the option in Old Testament culture of either having her stoned or having her put away. He was going to do the latter. But the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and from that he understood. And Joseph received Mary, and together they bore the shame they were looked upon as fornicators. Jesus spent his whole earthly life being looked upon by the religious authorities at least as, as they said on one occasion, we're not born of fornication. This was not hid under a bushel. It was talked about. Mouths wagged, tongues wagged. Oh, that child is born of, a forn a born of fornication. He's an illegitimate. Jesus bore that, along with many other things, on his way to Calvary. But the angel told Jesus, I mean, told Joseph, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Am I gripped by this message? Does it just flow off my lips and I don't really think about what that means? He shall save his people from their sins. When Jesus was born after being securely wrapped in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, he was laid in an animal's feeding trough. There was no room for him in the inn or in the guest room. Probably because of the, in addition to the taxing, this was probably the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I won't be dogmatic on that, but we know that Jesus uh, died on Passover. Um, the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, their seventh feast in the Old Testament, and they unfold the complete story of redemption, and Jesus is the fulfillment of every one of those feasts. And the Feast of Tabernacles has to do with God coming to dwell among, to tabernacle among men. So whether that's why there were so many people there, it doesn't really matter. The point of it is, as John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. And that's the astounding wonder of Bethlehem. Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, now tabernacles on the earth, in you. Your, your body is his temple, and he dwells with you. He dwells in you. Your heart is his home. So, as we think about God coming down to dwell among men, uh, let's remember that this is not just, this is not a history lesson. He has now come to dwell in your heart and mind. So let us not grieve, let us not quench the Holy Spirit. Then there's something else here 
when we turn to Isaiah, we, we find that long before the celebration that began with Gabriel's announcement to Mary and Joseph and the, and the reality of joy that that brought and transformation that brought in the New Testament Christians' lives, Isaiah the prophet, who had a, he had a hard road. He had to, to deliver many uh, warnings and impending judgments of wrath. But he was also told to write this. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. I don't know what all he understood about that. He seems to have been given more understanding there's all the Old Testament is filled with the, with the sacrifice of lambs and it's pointing toward the Lamb of God. And it's always dealing with an animal. But when you get to Isaiah 53, it's clear. We're not talking about an animal. We're talking about God sending someone to be the Lamb of God. And so he's given this revelation that a virgin is going to conceive and bring forth a son and it's not going to be any son, it's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. So again, here we are on December the 8th, 2019. And how wrapped up are we? How, how in awe are we? How, how much are we in wonder about God with us? The God of the universe, the God who created everything, came down into the womb of a peasant woman by means of the Holy Spirit, and he is God with us on the way to Calvary. We have so much going on every December. I think most would have to confess it all too often. Well, no, I, I, I really wanted to spend some time on that, but, you know, there's just so many things that are going on, and I just... Uh, many times our culture, whether it's secular or whether it's religious, it dazzles us with sights and sounds and fun and good intentions. It exhausts us. and leaves our spiritual senses dulled as to the great deep wonders of the birth of Christ. I appeal to you, I appeal to my own heart. Take these scriptures, read over them over and over again and let them get so saturated in your mind and heart that this historical reality of Bethlehem and Calvary will become fresh to us and powerful to where as we're looking at life we'll you know Paul was talking about deacons and elders in first Timothy chapter 3 and just seems like almost out of nowhere the very next verses are uh, the verses that talk about him being excited about Messiah without controversy Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You say, well, surely there should be some way that surely the Holy Spirit would want there to be some way to bring all of this before us. This is so important. It's so foundational to the Christian life. Uh, don't we have to do something? Sh shouldn't we do something? You remember Peter said uh, after the, uh, the, the great moment of, of the, what was that called? Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Uh, let's, let's build something. We need to do something? Well, God has done something. Of all the things that Jesus did and accomplished, the, the incredible wonders of his incarnation, the incredible wonders of the resurrection, the incredible wonders of him dying on the cross. He said, 
Here's what I want you to do. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's table. Which, when you understand it, it encompasses all the reality of the seven feasts. It encompasses the whole story of redemption. It doesn't leave us with being able to glow in something we did or we provided. There are those who do it with great pomp and circumstance, and they come in with great robes, and they're carrying this and that, and, and they, they believe, they're deceived, they believe that they can actually take that, that juice and turn it into the blood of Jesus, and, and that, that bread turns into the body of Jesus, and, and millions of people all over the world ooh and ah at that. That's not what he did. Amen. He just took bread and drank and said, do this in remembrance of me. And so the only, you, 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 you're not left with to be impressed with what you're drinking or with what you're eating. It sends you off immediately to that great awesome wonder that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed. And it's in context. How did that come to be? Well, from the very beginning of his arrival in the womb of Mary, it was known and understood, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. He was on the greatest missionary journey of all time. It was the greatest rescue from the greatest disaster of all time. It is the greatest war battle of all time, with the greatest victory. And the victor had no casualties. <laughs> when men fight even a good war, there's casualties. You say, oh, Jesus died. Yes. And God raised him up. Because at Calvary, he had satisfied. He had lived a sinless life. He had took upon himself our sins, and God raised him up. So it's no wonder that the angels, again, nothing, nothing dazzling, nothing reenacting, just, just do this. And so in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20, the angels get involved in proclaiming Messiah's birth. The angels have already been involved in bringing announcements to Joseph, to Mary. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20, they are rejoicing. Unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Do we get that? There's, it's just one focus here. A Savior is born. You don't need a Savior unless you're a sinner. And I talked to a man this week who is perfectly happy with himself. He said, I don't believe a lot of the things about Jesus. I've never read the Bible much, but there's a lot in there I don't believe. I don't believe there's a hell. But if there is a heaven, I know I'm going there. Because I am a good person. Now that's the blindness of sin and Satan. This man is to be pitied. He's to be prayed for. God may yet mercifully open his eyes and his heart. If you're here today and you, you, you can read these chapters in Matthew and Luke and get beyond just a little story, And realize that we're talking about the only hope, a Savior being born. Who was on his way to Calvary. Count your blessings. Amen. These angels are rejoicing because they realized that a gap was being bridged between sinful men and holy God. 
something that God did not do for fallen angels. Here is an unbridgeable gap. And a bridge has been put together by the work of Jesus Christ. And the shepherds returned. The shepherds got involved uh, in all of this as they heard the message of the angels. They returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and that was told to them. They began those, who, they began those who, who began to tell the good things that they had heard. The bridging of an unbridgeable gap between holy God and sinful man. You, you have to put the bad news into this good news story. Really? Well, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you have some bad news. You are a sinner without God and without hope unless Jesus Christ bridges the gap. And unless by grace you've come to put all of your hope and faith and trust in him. That's good news. You know why a lot of people treat it as just a story? Because they've never embraced the bad news. Why am I not at the emergency room at the hospital right now? As far as I know, I'm not sick. We, have, we were having a meeting here many years ago, and a lady just fell out on the floor, and there was a doctor sitting here. And, uh, of course, we all thought, oh, come on, Dr. Brown, go back. And, well, he goes back, and, and then he comes back and sits down. And some people helped this lady out. And he leaned over to the evangelist and said, you can't diagnose a case in front of an audience. I sent her to the hospital where she can be helped. She had a problem. She needed the hospital. You know why we don't get excited about the Lord's Supper? We have let the culture anesthetize us to the reality of the problem. We'd give lip service, oh, I'm not a bad person, while, then, while we, we'd say, oh, no, I know we're all sinners, and yet we, we act like we don't need a Savior. As you go on, so move toward the end here, in Luke chapter 2, Roman numerals chapter 7, or number 7, Jesus was circumcised, presented to the temple, adored by Simeon and Anna. And then in Matthew 2, the wise men came and they worshipped. Jesus was about two years old at that point. It's a wonderful day when you see who Jesus is and that he's worthy of worship. And then Mary and Joseph, Roman number 9, they fled Herod slaughtered the children. Herod was afraid of Jesus. Jesus was a rival king. This is our problem with Jesus Christ. We're smart enough to know that if he's on the throne, we're not. He will be Lord, or he will not be in your life or mine. So in his attempt to kill Jesus, he slaughtered boys up to two years old. He was afraid. Am I afraid of Jesus Christ this morning? Or can I say with the Apostle Paul, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. This is a great mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. We know that Jesus was manifest to take away our sin. I hope that in these days that you and I will be greatly impacted by the birth of Christ as never before. Because we have taken God at his word. He was on the greatest missionary journey of all time to deal with the greatest problem of all time, 
to bridge the unbridgeable gap by being the God-man who laid down his life and took it up. And he calls out to sinners. That's the qualification for Jesus to be of help to you or to me. I first own that I'm a sinner. Let's bow our heads and hearts for prayer. Our Father, we bless you and praise you for the wonder of salvation for sinners. May this be a day and may the days ahead grip us. May we just be riding down the road or doing whatever and we're just gripped and stunned afresh and anew while I was without hope and without God Jesus Christ died he came he lived he died he humbled himself took upon himself the form of a man so that he could die so that he could take our penalty may our hearts be flooded with worship may we be those that, that are steadfast in serving the Lord out of gratitude for your amazing grace. Have your own way in our hearts and lives, and we bless you for it in Jesus' name.